G'day Sam. How you going? I'm doing very well. Welcome to everyone for our 12th episode of Enjoy the Journey podcast with Aureus Financial. I'm Jackson Millard, Wealth Mentor, co-founder and CEO of Aureus Financial. Uh, my name is Sam Flitter. I am the co-founder and the CEO of Aureus Financial. <sighs> you can see today we've got, a, we've got a change of scenery, so we've gotten a bit of feedback. We thought we'd switch it up a little bit, yeah, pretty it up with some flowers. Make it a little bit more interesting for uh, the, the, the viewers out there who uh, tune into our podcast on YouTube. Uh, give you some more exciting things to look at than just our bearded faces. <laughs> so uh, it's good that we can uh, we can go and uh, catch up again, mate. So I think um, I really enjoy the format where we kind of just banter amongst ourselves. Mm. Of course, it's really good to get some some really good insights from other entrepreneurs and and business owners out there. Um, but I think this is just a good form a form uh, format for us to to spitball about our own journeys in business and uh, and have a bit of a yarn. Yeah, look, I think it's going to be interesting as it develops over time because we've done the podcast. This is our 12th episode. We're 10 weeks in on the business. So we started doing this a couple of weeks before the business actually started. Mm. Um, so, you know, it will be interesting to look back in five or 10 years' time to see the things that we're talking about today and things we're talking about in 10 years' time and, yeah. you know, what the business does and, and how it evolves. It'll give most people a, a really good insight what it takes to build a, a business from scratch, I think. Yeah, I think our beards will be much longer by then as well. <laughs> um, probably a few greys in there also. My greys are coming. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's interesting, mate. I think this is a great way for us to document the journey. Um, and and look, we talk about this all the time, that um, far, uh, not often enough business owners take the time to reflect on what's really important mm. and take time to measure their success and learn from their their experiences. Um, and I think that from all of the, the workshops and conversations that we've had with a lot of our clients, most people just, just don't have time. Um, everyone seems to be really battling with managing their time and knowing how do they invest their time. Uh, and I think it comes down to really them not reflecting on what's really important. We're always going to be busy and we're always going to make best time or best use of the time that we have available. So how can we make better use of that time? I think it's hard because I think a lot of people, without challenging themselves and and unless they have someone else to challenge them, they just become complacent Mm. and they they get stuck in the habit of just repeating the same things over and over again, especially in business. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think when you reflect, you have to ask yourself what you want and then challenge yourself as to why you haven't got it yet, Correct. and then you have to sort of grow. That's that's the first step, I think. Yeah, well, let's talk about it, mate. So I think the key theme for today for everyone is really talking about time management. Um, mm-hmm. This is a really common theme, and I think that it's something that's not really spoken about en- enough. Um, and, and we try and stay clear of the, the sexy stuff when it comes to, to, to business and, and finance and wealth. Um, we try and stick to the stuff that is a little bit against the grain, uh, that not many people like to talk about. Um, and in this case, look, of course, everyone's busy. Everyone's always busy. Um, so time management is, is kind of, it goes without saying. Um, that mm. people need to know how to manage their time. Um, so I figured today we'll kind of dive into how we've chosen how to invest our time, what, what, what that's resulted in for us, and, and what that means for us moving forwards um, in, in the growth of our business and, and, uh, and where that's going to hopefully lead us. What do you think is one of the biggest wins that you're doing at the moment or that you've implemented over the past few months in the business to make better use of your time? Well, I think that it's something that I, I, I started a long time ago that's allowed me to do what I do every day and I, I'm very efficient with my time. Mm. Um, I get a lot done. Um, and when I compare myself to my peers and other people in similar positions, um, I, I find myself getting a lot more done than they do. Mm. And it comes down to how I've structured my time and my day. Um, and a lot of this I picked up from a mentor that I had uh, quite a while back now um, by the name of Harry Mustakis. And um, he was uh, the principal of uh, a firm that I was working in. And he was very, very tactical with how he invested his time. 
Um, and, and look, although some of the strategy that he used were a little bit outdated, he still had a, a physical diary that he wrote in every day and, <laughs> uh, and, and kind of keep, keep uh, track of his time. Um, and he'd always write it in pencil just in case anything changed. He could rub it out <laughs> and change it. Um, he highlighted the important meetings. But all of those fundamentals I applied, putting my own spin on it, to be able to structure my day that I can get the most done. And one of the things that, that Harry taught me and something that I, I've, I've always tried to follow is color coding your diary and allocating time for everything that you wanna do. Because although nothing always goes to plan 100%, because you've set out that structure, you are probably only gonna be out by 15 or 30 minutes a day. Mm. But you're always going to be heading in the right direction for the time that you've allocated to get stuff done. So for example, first thing in the morning, I block out time in my diary. There's no appointments, no distractions where I can just work on strategy, whether it be marketing strategy, um, operational strategy, um, content strategy, whatever it may be. Um, and then I then have all of my, my client meetings um, color-coded in a certain color, uh, strategic partner meetings in a certain color, team meetings in a certain color, and even down to personal time. I try and block out in my diary, and of course I've had to make a number of exceptions to those uh, <laughs> those personal meetings because at, at the moment business takes priority over all else, mm -hmm. um, but they're still in the diary because I'm making an active decision to choose whether I override that in pursuit of something that I'm trying to get done in the business. Mm -hmm. It's still there, I haven't forgotten about it. Um, so having that structure means that I spend very little time scratching my head of what I should do next. Mm. It, having that structure, no, oh, okay, now, now this is the time I'm supposed to be doing this. Um, and having that structure just makes life a lot easy, be, uh, a lot easier because as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, the, the only person that you is holding you accountable is you. Mm. So if you don't have a structure to work towards, you're constantly thinking of what's the next thing that I'm supposed to be doing with my time. Yeah, I think it's really important. You don't want to waste any time. You don't want to waste one minute. You know, when you're when you're at work, you want to be as efficient as possible. How often do you reflect on those tasks that you're doing and think, is this still a value adding task, or is there something better I can be doing with my time? Yeah, I, I I'm always trying to think about that. Um, but I think that there's still a long way to go. Like it's mm -hmm. a constant improvement, a constant iteration. Um, like for example. Um, we used to write all of our file notes manually mm. and I wouldn't do it I'd task it to Sal um, poor Sal and um, he'd spend 30 minutes or 45 minutes writing all the file notes of, of the outcomes of a client's situation and unfortunately that's just a really inefficient use of sales time mm. um, because there's better things that he could be doing so we said well why aren't we doing this a different way why aren't we transcribing this or, or documenting it uh, the audio and then sending it to get transcribed so instead of taking 30 to 45 minutes to write the the full transcription ourselves why don't we record one to three minutes of audio of us speaking out the the, the notes sending it to a, tra a transcription service who charges us a dollar a minute and for three bucks we're buying back 40 minutes of our time it's a no-brainer it's a no-brainer and that's worked really really well even as far as when we were working on that initiative last weekend to try and uh, build our magazine, mm. we go, oh yeah, let's, okay, let's write the content. No, wait a minute. Instead of writing the content, I'm just going to record 10, 15 minutes of me speaking, mm. which is going to get me my first draft. It's not going to be perfect, but most of it's going to be there. So then I can, at least then I can have something that I can refine or send to um, yeah, our offshore team to refine further uh, and, and really polish it up. So an exercise that probably would have taken us an hour and a half took me 10 minutes. Mm. So the little efficiencies like this that I think a lot of business owners overlook and they don't put enough emphasis on these just small time savings that, that compound and add up throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year um, that really allows you to buy back your time. Yeah, and I think you need to do it. Look at, you know, there's, there's a few things I'm thinking of now. Look at Bonjoro, you know, that email yeah. system we've got now. Give you guys a little bit of background. It's it's essentially you get your phone. It's an app on your phone. You do it like you like you're taking a selfie and you, you say whatever you want to say to the client or to whoever it is. And then this this app will send the video uh, to the the client via an email. And you know you've just condensed a, a ten minute email into a thirty second uh, video clip, and it it gets a lot more attention as well. So there's yeah. just all these little these little things that you just don't think about, but in isolation, they're not going to make or break you, but no. 
in compounding when you do you know a hundred of these things better than you were doing them uh, six months ago or twelve months ago even a month ago then that adds up to more efficiency in the business correct and look it's, it's always that thing that you've got to be hunting for opportunities to improve your business by working on it uh, because mm-hmm. if you're always working in it you're never going to have the time mm-hmm. um, like we were speaking to to a client recently and they fell into this trap of they bring all these clients in um, they've made a, a great amount of money, but then because they're a, a service business, then they've got to go deliver on the service. And obviously that takes time, and that takes time away from hunting for new business. So they've got this roller coaster ride of cash flow. And the problem there, and the number one problem there is time management. That they can, ne- can never escape that, that roller coaster if they don't make better use of their time mm-hmm. or delegate pieces that were previously consuming their time so they can stick to what they do best either doing the craft and delivering the service or bringing on new clients and, and basically ins- and basically making a promise for your for your craftspeople or technicians to deliver on. And this is something, this is a, I think we hear a lot from business owners, they come back to us and they say, they say, well, that's great in theory, mm. but I can't get the resources or I can't get the staff to, to help me execute on it. And it, it's, I think that's always going to be tricky. And I think the more skilled um, and the more niche that, the, mm. that you need your team to be, I think it's harder and harder to find that, that person to fulfill the role. I used to agree. I don't anymore. Um, and I think this is a principle that I've tried to follow more and more um, as I've continued through my entrepreneurial journey. And something that my old man once told me, um, it's kind of a Chinese proverb, he who said he can and he who said he mm-hmm. can't are both right. Mm-hmm. So if, if whatever you say will become a self-fulfilling prophecy because you will ensure that you fulfill your own beliefs. And if you believe that there aren't, there aren't any talented people out there, um, that um, you, you can only find crappy staff that aren't committed, um, you are the root cause of that problem. And you will find that because you're holding that frame, you are passing that that that's belief onto those staff members and you are you are dooming them essentially yeah well you make you're making yourself right so you have higher right. crappy staff members exactly. to prove your theory right exactly it's all subconscious but it happens it happens so here's the thing let's paint a picture right let's assume that we were in uh, some type of, of business utopia right where we could commoditize all of the crappy things that these expert technicians had to do in their role. Mm. So they could just stick to what they do best. Mm. So assuming they no longer had to do admin, they no longer had to do the follow-up, they no longer had to do the, the kind of low-level, um, kind of basic, repeatable tasks. They could just stick to doing what they do best and do more of it. Um, if we could create an environment like that, do you think that it would be hard to find technicians that would want to sit in a role like that? No, of course not. Because it's appealing, right? Yes. So this is the problem. I think that a lot of people are, are putting really good technicians into roles that aren't allowing them to exercise their expertise. Mm. And it's because you are expecting them to fit into the... You're trying to put a, 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 a circle into a square hole, you know what mm. I mean? Um, so it's, it's one of those things that you need to be able to create an environment where your expert technicians can flourish, can be fulfilled... And can be paid what they, that they what they mm-hmm. deserve to earn, um, because we've seen it time and time again. You put these experts into a business where they're caught up in all of the the crap and operational stuff that weighs them down, meaning that they're investing time in non income producing activity, which means they can't reach their potential, which ultimately means that they're going to leave for another organisation that gives them. That, that, that framework to operate and thrive. Yeah, well, they can spend their time doing doing the stuff they like. And I, I have first-hand experience of this. At the last firm uh, we worked at, uh, as you know, I was doing all the, all the finance stuff and I was doing the whole process from start to finish on my own. And I was really, really efficient and I was getting a lot of work done, uh, a lot of hours, but I had a lot of systems and processes in place that I guess allowed me to be really efficient. Mm. And you and I, when we started Warriors, we sort of dissected that those systems and processes and we, we built them out through our intranet and, and commoditized it to the point where 70 or 80 percent of, of the tasks that were related to writing a home loan could be delegated. Correct. Another team member uh, could, could do them. Mm. And we built that out now and it's 
you know, it took it took a few months to put together, but it works now. And right. there's any questions that pop up, uh, it's there, it's in the intranet, and you've essentially got rid of, you know, 80% of the tasks of writing home loans, whereas I think probably 99% of the, the broking industry is still trying to do everything themselves, do you know what I mean? And here's the problem, and not just in our industry, but a lot of industries, that skilled labor is only getting more expensive yeah and the cost to serve is increasing and who ultimately pays the bill for that the customer Mm. and i think that particularly in professional services it is increasing the barrier to entry for people who really need that expertise Mm. and because they just can't they can't afford it or they can't justify the investment because it's too much of a risk for the quantified value so therefore the only way to combat that is to try and reduce the cost to serve so we believe, hands down, that you should be creating and implementing an offshore team in any business that you mm, have. Correct. Um, we've proven that it works. We have a high-performing uh, offshore team that does phenomenal work. Um, in, in many cases, they're, they're higher performing than what I've experienced with local staff in the past. Correct. Because they're passionate about what they do. They want to work hard. Um, they, they believe in the vision and they, they appreciate the time and effort that we're investing in them to see them to the, come to their fullest potential. And I think that's the biggest thing, mate. They appreciate the opportunity that, that you're providing with them. It's very hard in a, in a city uh, like Sydney that's full of money. There's a lot of money in Sydney. Unemployment's next to nothing. Um, it's hard for, I guess, team members to really appreciate opportunities that they're given. There's opportunities everywhere. There's opportunities everywhere, and there's a lot of money around, and it's, it's you know, we've offshore stuff, it's just not the case. Correct. And look, I think that by doing that, and by having the, op- the infrastructure to support it, and allow both local and offshore staff to work cohesively together, mm. then you can create that, that business utopia that I mentioned before, mm. where you can have your experts doing what they do best, commoditize your low end, and deliver exceptional outcomes to your clients uh, at a reasonable price. But this is a this is an SME problem. This is a small to medium enterprise mm. issue because big business has been doing this for a hundred years. Correct. Do you know what I mean? It's only the small business owners and the medium sized business owners mm. that uh, have been slow to embrace. You know the the globalization of, of the world. So it's not. This is not a new thing. We're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just utilizing what's already been invented a long time ago you know in the 1900s so Mm. it's i I enjoy it i think it's good i think it's good too and so i think let's kind of dive into i guess our experience with setting up the infrastructure to support having an offshore team Mm. because i think that's where most people fall off and and i know from from first-hand experience um, back when I started my first business and when I was consulting, um, I, I tried on a number of occasions to outsource. Um, and, and on a lot of occasions, it, it failed. Um, mm-hmm. And I've tried to reflect on the year, over the years why it's failed. Um, and it was really that I didn't have the infrastructure to be able to support them appropriately in their role. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, because of that, it had a flow-on effect to the quality of the work that was delivered. So I think that the biggest, I guess, objection for most local businesses in in the SME space is well how can I bring on these these virtual uh, virtual employees these offshore employees and ensure that they can be as successful as possible Mm. so from your experience mate what what do you think is the the biggest contributing factor to your your offshore team being successful that they were a genuine part of our team they're invested in the vision um, they, they want or is to succeed as much as we want them to succeed. I remember, you know, I had a, I had a conversation with, with one of our guys um, in the Philippines a couple of weeks ago, and we're talking about different stuff. And obviously, you and I are, are in business. We know a little bit about about business, about investing, and stuff like that. And I, you know, I said, mate, you know, I know you've got a little side business. If there's anything that you need from us. Uh, for us to be able to help you personally, you reach out to me, reach out to Jackson, and we'll do whatever we can to support you so you achieve your goals. No different to you know how we we've sailed. It's the Correct. same thing, and it blew his mind. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, it's that we're taking a genuine interest in wanting them to succeed, and I think you actually have to have a genuine interest and want your team Correct. to succeed in their personal lives as well. I think treating uh, if you treated them as if they were just a commodity or something like that, then that's that's not only is it bad business, but I think um, that's for integrity and ethics. I think that's mm-hmm. a wrong way to treat 
not a year. Yeah, I've always tried to have a very hands-on approach with any of my staff and try and nurture them f- through to their fullest potential. Mm. And um, the reasons why that's so important is because if you're not investing in them, why should they invest in you or your business? Correct. Um, and it's one of those things that um, a lot of business owners tend to overlook it um, because they just believe that people turn up, they get paid, and they just do their thing. You know, those days are finished. They, they, you know, you, you picture the the big fat factory worker, um, and everyone comes to work, and there's a hundred staff, a hundred team members, and the, the big fat boss yells at everyone, tells them what to do, and they just do it because they're scared to lose their job. It, 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 we're not in the Great Depression anymore. No. We're not in the wartime. Like the world has changed. You mm. can't you can't just treat people like rubbish yeah. and expect to get something out of them. It, it it doesn't work like that anymore. No, well look. I, one of my uh, my clients and friends once said to me that um, people don't leave the business, they leave the leader. Yeah, I believe that. And I think that as leaders, it is our objective not only to lead and empower our clients with the best possible outcomes that we can possibly deliver from, from our business, but it's important that we do the same for our staff. Mm-hmm. And I've heard a lot of people that have a very backwards mentality, irrespective of whether they have local or, or overseas staff. They go, oh, all I'm doing is training them for the next person. Or all I'm going to do is I'm going to train them, they're going to take all of my intellectual property and they're going to go start their own business. I go, fantastic, that's a great thing. And what do you mean? I've invested all this time for nothing. No, you've invested all of this time in order for that person throughout the tenure of their, their experience working with you to deliver the best possible experience to your customers over that time. Correct. And it's your job to nurture them through and push them out into the world. If they want to be a business owner, if they want to, to move to another organization because they believe that that's the best decision for them, then fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it's, it's very self-destructive to, uh, to, to think of that mentality or oh, I'm not going to invest time in them because they're just going to leave. I don't think you get ahead thinking like that. It yeah. just—it's such a limiting factor. Correct. You just won't train anyone. Or I got it a lot when I was in the spray painting industry, when mm-hmm. I was in the smash repair industry. A lot of these guys—they—they'd always say th- you know cheeky things like oh you know don't don't show them everything you know or things like mm-hmm. that. And it's what like that's a very limited Correct. mentality. Do you know what I mean? And you're only going to be able to achieve so much thinking that way mm. which is I think the opposite of what we do we just throw everything at everyone that it doesn't matter strangers clients team members everyone just gets everything well, we've you've got you've got to deliver value because ultimately if people can take that value and go implement implement it for themselves then fantastic yeah like I remember I, I had a job it was one of my first advisor jobs right I was working for this guy and he was a bit of a slave driver and um, like if we stopped dialing and, and calling people and had a bit of a banter in the office he would stand up and say, what are you guys doing? Oh, get back on the phones. Um, and I remember that I expressed to him that I, I was interested in starting my own business. And the, the, the best piece of advice that he could rustle up at the time was, oh, well, make sure you don't buy a bubble jet printer because if you send people documents in the mail and it rains, the ink will run everywhere. That was his best piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> then when I, I, t- I told him that, uh, not long after, he, uh, he fired me. And then afterwards, when he found out that I, uh, that I, I was basically looking to go out on my own, um, he threatened to sue me. Um, so it was that self-destructive that he was willing to try and scare me and, and use these kind of bullying tactics mm-hmm. um, to just because he believed that I'd done something uh, he, he was hard done by because I was leaving mm-hmm. and it, I've experienced this this a lot either directly or indirectly um, and, and it's really a backwards mentality and, and I think that this is the crux of why a lot of people who think about offshoring fail mm-hmm. um, you need to be willing to bring these people into your family right like yeah, Aureus and our business we, Everyone in our team is part of the family. Mm. Um, even our clients are part of the family. Um, and it's having that, that sense of, of passion and care uh, that separates us. Mm. And I think that if you're not willing to have that, that nurturing uh, mentality, if you're, you're there to nurture your, your team uh, and, and help them reach their fullest potential, then your opportunities for success are very slim. Mm. I agree with that. Mm. And I think further to that, it's about kind of having... The, the, the right plan in place. 
I think our intranet and, uh, and, and that strategy of being able to map out all of the repeatable processes in our business is, is really the reason why our ability to continue to scale our offshore team will be a lot easier as we progress. Yeah, even I think our on, onshore team as well, and I think, see, it, it all ties in, right? Mm. So we, we invest a lot of uh, time, energy, and resources into this intranet that we're building. Mm. And from what I can see, we're gonna be investing a lot of time, energy, and effort into it for the foreseeable future, right. all right? So everything and all the training that we, we're doing with all our team members, it's all being recorded, mm. right? It's all going on the internet and it's staying there and it's slowly becoming an asset, all right? So a lot of these guys, if they're training someone mm. and they're not recording any of it, they're not keeping any of this training, and then that person ups and leaves and that's what they're scared of, they're taking all that asset with yeah. them. If they would have spent the time to build that into an asset that they keep and they can just as quickly or even 10 times as fast train the next person into the role, you haven't really lost anything. So that's a that's a failure on the leader to not see that, you know, see it as a threat rather than as the opportunity that it is. Correct. Do you know what I mean? I don't think that would resonate with a lot of people. No, it's a bit, uh, it's it's against the grain. Yeah. Um, and look, we were speaking to Paul Wright for our last mm. podcast. And Paul he's said- He's a master at this. He's a master at this. What he, does, what he does best. And, and he spoke about most people think your systems and processes is a, is a, is a bound document that you leave in the office. And he was talking about an experience of somebody that he knew, uh, they had a member of their team, come in one Saturday after hours or whatever, took that down to <laughs> office works, scanned all the systems and processes, and then buggered off and opened up their own business with the, the how-to manual, the, the basic... How to run a business. How to run a business. <laughs> one of those for dummies books, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, I think that... That further illustrates, I guess, uh, to a degree, the, the cultural aspect that people create through that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, but it's 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 interesting to see that um, that these things are happening. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, and look, at the end of the day, um, I, I always have the mentality because it's what we've done. If you're good at what you do, you will work for yourself. Yes. So you need to understand that there's going to be key members of your team, the high performers that are ultimately going to get to a point, if you don't give them equity or give them a stake or skin in the game in your business, they are going to go out and do it for themselves. Um, because it's just in their, it's in their nature. It's what they strive to be. Correct, and I, I have it as a, there's a ceiling, right? Mm. And when, when someone's not an owner in the business, they always feel like they hit the ceiling. Mm. So you do need to remove that. You do need to have your key staff take equity in the business and continue pushing up their own ceiling, right? They've essentially become limitless at right. how far they want to push things. And big business has done this right for years, mm. right? So, you know, all your exec teams, all these big companies are on share bonus schemes, they're on options. equity schemes, yeah. option schemes, right? And they, whilst they get a good salary, a large part of their remuneration is actually shares Correct. in the business that they're working for. So it's allowed these big businesses because they all started as small businesses to grow into a medium-sized business and then into a large and then into you know, multinationals and grow massive. But most small to medium business owners, a lot of them are either, you know, not one-man beans, but one founder or two founders like us. Mm. And they probably have this scarcity mentality because when they started, they built up, they built this beast, you know, they built it into a five-man team or a 10-man team. And, you know, there's some key staff members that want some equity and they don't want to give nothing away because they work so hard to build it. But you limit yourself then. Correct. Because you, what will happen, you hit your 10 staff, you hit your, you know, two million a year turnover, five million a year, whatever it is. And then a couple of your key staff leave, you take a couple of steps backwards, revenue falls, profit falls. You know, you're back on the tools. You're back on the tools and then you've got to start again. You've got to build the, the team back up. You would have been better off giving five or 10% away to a couple of these guys and then letting them become the Correct. leaders of the business. And there's a methodology to go about it. So to give you the theory behind it, and this is leadership theory 101, there's a, there's a theory, and I think we've referred to it in a previous podcast called agency theory. And it's a theory that's often used in publicly listed companies because you need to understand that your exec team are agents. Mm. They're there and they're employed by the owners, the shareholders of the company, of your CBAs and BHPs and NABs of the world, 
to represent them and act in their best interest. But agency theory states that if your agents aren't remunerated in such a way that aligns the values of themselves and the values of the owners, then they will always look after themselves. Correct. That's why you see these big multinational companies uh, who have leadership teams that drive the business into the ground or, or take it so, so far away from its strategic objectives because they've been, their remuneration has been structured in a way where they have always worked to get themselves the best possible game. Because mm. at the end of the day, yeah, they want to appease shareholders, but you got to eat too. It's human nature, mate. Yeah. People will always take care of themselves. So this go- it comes down to an SME level as well. If you're in a small business, your staff are agents. You are employing them to represent you as the owner. Mm. So if you can't align the objectives of your agents with the objectives of you as an owner, then they will always take care of themselves. Correct. And you can do this in a number of ways. So you can have, if you don't want to give away equity, you can have profit share arrangements, Mm. which basically links the profitability of the business with the remuneration that your your staff and your your team members will achieve. You can also go and take a long tail approach to say, okay, uh, I will give key staff members equity, but that's held in a a facility called escrow for a number of years. Let's Mm. say it's five years. So let's say for argument's sake, you have a key staff member and you say, I'll get to give you 5% over five years, 1% a year, and all of that equity is held in escrow until the fifth year. So what that means is that during that time, so let's say year one, they get 1%, year two, they get two, and they're still getting the profits off the back of that equity ownership, but they don't actually physically own the equity until they hit the vesting date, which is five years. So what that means is you've got a staff member guaranteed to stay with you for five years, otherwise they forfeit their equity. Which is substantial amounts. Like we're not talking small amounts of money. When a business is getting that big, we're talking six figures or seven figures. We're talking considerable amounts. It's considerable of cash. amounts there. And even if you are just getting started, um, it can be a very cheap way for you to keep staff members motivated and on board for longer. Mm. Just think about it. How 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 much is it worth to you to keep your best staff members three, four, five, six, seven years, as opposed to the average tenure for most employees these days is eighteen months, two years, and then they're gone. Mm. You if if you got a high performing person, it takes you twelve months to get them up to scratch. So you've got to make up for that lost time. So your break even point's probably 18 months. And if you're only keeping them for two years, you've got six months of profit. Yeah, and this is, this is it's not for everyone. No. Right? So this is not, not everyone who comes into a business, works there for six months and then gets ownership in the business. That's, That's not how it works. This is about ensuring that your superstars remain superstars with you. Correct. Do you know what I mean? A rising tide lifts all yeah. ships. You're better off working together to, to nail it yeah. rather than you know, splitting into 10 different pieces and everyone going their own way. And look, here's the thing that I think a lot, a lot of the objections that I've heard from te- speaking to people about this and even personal experiences, that everyone always says, ah, oh, but what if they t- don't turn out to be what they, they, they're cracked up to be um, and we leave on bad terms or they burn me or whatever. Um, and there's, there's ways, there's legal arrangements and mm. things that you can put into place to avoid that from happening or minimise the impact of that stuff happening. Because, of course, there's always going to be people that really show their true colours at some point and it's really hard for you to ascertain early in the piece. Um, but you can protect yourself. Mm. Um, you can ensure that you don't have uh, a, a, an equity holder in your business that is draining it um, mm. and, and, and detracting away from what you're trying to do or trying to sabotage uh, what, what you're trying to do by getting the right advice and having the right legal agreements in place. And I think that there's a, like a minimum requirement, right? So let's yeah, let's use you and I as an example. So we're good friends, right? Yeah. Outside of the business, we have been for years. Yeah. We still have a very watertight shareholders agreement. Correct. Do you know what I mean? And that's just about being prudent. We're not preparing for, for the divorce one day. Yeah. But if push comes to shove, God forbid something were to happen, mm. you need to be able to structurally, mm. you know, sort it out and... I think when you hear about a lot of the horror stories, it's probably guys that are winging it a little bit. hundred percent, mate. They, they, all, they say, oh, it'll be all right, we'll be okay, and they don't, <laughs> they don't formalise the agreement. And that was another lesson that Harry taught me from back in the day. Funnily, funnily enough, Harry and I didn't leave on best terms. Um, <laughs> but he always said to me, he goes, you, as soon as you get married, you should be drafting your divorce papers. And the reason why it's the best time is because it's when you're all in the best spirits mm. and you can objectively come up with the rule book that is going to help you navigate the times when 
you don't like each other. Mm. Because like, for example, in our shareholders agreement, we have a good levers clause and a bad levers clause. Mm. There's basically a list of circumstances in which position you as a good lever, somebody mm. leaving the organisation under good terms, yeah. or a bad lever, someone who's stuffed up and done something wrong. And, and there are, and the bad lever events are extremely detrimental for whoever the bad lever is. Yes. So not only does it give you an objective rule book to go by if the event happens, it scares us away from ever being a bad lever because that's yeah, the last thing the, you want to do. The consequences are so horrific uh, for leaving on, on bad terms. To give you guys a little bit of background, so the difference between a good lever and a bad lever, right? Let's say that uh, you had uh, two shareholders in a business like Jackson and I, and you had someone who was a bad lever, let's say someone was literally stealing money from their company bank accounts, right? That's a, that's a bad lever scenario and they're essentially going to uh, forfeit nearly all their rights as shareholders and they're gonna lose a substantial amount of money over it. However, if you had an event where you had two partners and one of them fell very ill or their wife or their partner or their children or someone in the family fell very, very ill and that person could no longer work, uh, then that would be a good lever event uh, because whilst it's horrific circumstances, nothing uh, malicious has been done by the shareholders. So the terms are, are easier and they make it nicer for, for the two partners to, to part way. So that's, that's sort of the differences between being a good lever and being a bad lever. It's yeah. like being a good bloke and a bad bloke. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. We all want to be good blokes. Good blokes. Um, and look, uh, this, this is about having conversation, um, ha sometimes having the hard conversation mm. um, about being willing to play devil's advocate because mm. you need to ensure that you can plan for as many contingencies. And, and our lawyer, um, Robin King, uh, shout out to Robin, he's a phenomenal bloke, uh, always said, you never how good, know how good a shareholders agreement is until you need to use it. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so, yeah, so time will tell. Um, so it's one of those You're things. You're written on a napkin. Yeah, exactly. And look, there's been circumstances where people haven't done it and it's been very, very, very painful um, because there's no rule book to go by. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you're willing in the first instance to talk openly about the, the, the potential outcomes mm -hmm. and the likelihood of those outcomes and the implications of those outcomes so then you can build the rules around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, mate. It's interesting, and look, the amount of business owners I know that do not have these types of agreements in place is just crazy. Look, I think a lot of business owners aren't doing things, uh, how would you put it? I think they're not doing things correctly. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter what, you know, how or what part of the mm. business it is, that they're not doing it as business people. You know, and we've said it before, a lot of people get into business because they're really good technicians, mm. and then they, they go into business, while well, technically they're in a business, but they're still behaving like a technician rather than a business owner. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's it's a different skill set. I think we learned that very quickly. We had to, you know, what it took to, to be a good uh, a good wealth coach or a good finance broker, and what it takes to own a wealth business uh, they're, they're two different things. They're two yeah. different sets of skills. And I think it's also the pain that people think that they've got to go through to pay for these things. Um, I think that a lot of people don't justify the value of things like legal structures, mm. legal agreements, um, uh, insurance and risk management strategies, all of these things where we both pay a lot of money for. It's very expensive. You know what I mean? You spend a lot of cash yeah, on A lot of cash, things. mate. A lot of cash. I don't like spending cash. So that hurts me every time. <laughs> but you have to do it. Like there's no... It, it, there's just no other way. You, you, if you're going to be a business person, you have to operate as a business person. You Correct. have to have your legalities ticked off. You have to have your insurances ticked off. Um, and you've got to spend the money. There's no other way around it. Yeah, I think the old saying goes, you buy once and you cry once. Um, yeah. Because you're going to cry when you pay the bill to get these things done, but you're not going to cry later on. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, that's uh, an interesting takeaway. So, mate, I think uh, looking forward, obviously, um, we've, we've put a lot of time and effort into our infrastructure of our business, the operations, we've got all the legal agreements, we've got all the entities set up, we've got our business strategy, we've got a, a team now of eight people. Um, we're, we're growing pretty rapidly given that, what, we've been in business uh, a total of... Ten weeks. Ten weeks. Ten weeks. Is um, so, mate, what, what are you mo are so excited about over the next ten weeks uh, of what we're working towards? Mate, ten weeks is a long time. Um, Look, you've, you've seen me over there in the corner. I've sort of been keeping to myself the, the, this past week or so. I'm excited about 
uh, putting our acquisition strategy into place. Mm. Um, you know, or as part of our business model is we're going to accumulate other small businesses in in our sector in the financial services sector. We're going to amalgamate them into Aureus and try to grow Aureus quickly uh, that way. Um, that actually takes a lot of work, you know, mm-hmm. to put the due diligence together, to get the funding from the investors, to get the funding from the bank, and then to put a strategy to, you know, complete the transaction and, and get the most out of the, the acquisition. And I'm excited because, you know, your your uh, book from the, your previous business is, is currently, you know, I think this very second coming. Any second. Any second now is coming into the business and then, you know, we had a meeting this week with another small business owner that it's 99% likely we're going to acquire his business. And I'm excited to, to keep that momentum up. It's, you know, it's all new to me. It's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of hard work, but it's, it's exciting. It's exciting stuff. I agree, mate. I think the thing that excites me the most is um, sharing the vision. Like, my, the book that I wrote, um, to think that our strategy was that was our first thing to push out into the market mm. to see what people thought about our ideas and what we've created and we launched it the beginning or the, the end of january and now it's an international bestseller in eight countries um it's it's, curr- get it. it's currently in australia it's the second bestseller second only to the barefoot investor whose book's been out for two years and he sold like four hundred and thirty thousand copies it was the best-selling book in the country last year out of all categories. Correct. So to be up there with and that, it's taken two years good. to get there. Yeah. Um, so it's just it's surreal for where we're at at the moment, and, and I think the key thing for me is that just shows me that we need to share the vision with as many people as we possibly can um, to help people really invest into what we're trying to create um, and the the thought leadership that we're pushing, um, because we know that we're going to create some pretty profound change over the, the coming months and years. So. Man, I think people are getting it. I think they like it. I think what we're bringing is is very important. I think a lot of people just, well, I was going to say that they, they didn't know it existed. It didn't exist. It didn't exist before we started putting it together. And I, I think all the, you know, a lot of the content that we're putting out on social media, we're putting a lot of effort into that. And I think that's reaching a lot of people and a lot of people starting to um, not understand entirely, but they're starting to, to look at it and go, I get what these guys are saying. I should probably have a good, hard look at myself and and think about my own circumstances. I had, you know, someone on on Facebook this week uh, get in touch with me and sort of say, look, I don't know exactly what you guys do, but I need your help. Do you know what I mean? And it's, I don't mind that. I don't mind that. They they know that, they don't know exactly what we're going to do, but they know that when it it comes to, you know, money and wealth and lifestyle and and goals and all these things, that we can help them Mm. achieve that, so. Yeah, I think the other thing that I'm really excited about, and this is kind of both the overall theme of what we've spoken about today, is that as as leaders, it is our, our number one goal to inspire as many people in our team, in our client base, to take action and mm. and really bring our, our vision to, to life. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to continuing to scale our team, um, to, to, to scale the family, mm. um, continue to, to nurture these, these tremendous individuals who are just so willing to contribute value to, to us and our clients and our network um, and help them reach their fullest potential. Like look at look at our, our team in the, the short amount of time that they've been on board and how far they've come. Yeah, it's like they they've always been part of Aureus. It's like Aureus has always existed and, and we've always known each other. We've known each other all for ten weeks. Exactly. You know, right. and yeah. Even less for some of the guys. Mate, but it's, it's look, I, I like it, mate. I like the impact that we're having. I think especially especially with our clients as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw some of our clients the other night, husband and wife, they come up to me and they're hugging me and they're kissing me and that's there's not many people that have that sort of relationship mm. with their clients that you're doing such good things for them. Do you know what I mean? Correct. That you're literally changing their life. So mm. I think it's good stuff, mate. I think it's I think it's exciting. I think it's it's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, I can't believe it's only been ten weeks. I feel like we've been at this for ten years, <laughs> <laughs> mate. We've got a long way to go. Yeah, it's, way uh, to go. it's very exciting. Well. Um, I think we've covered some good content today. Um, mm. Hopefully you guys are, are enjoying the podcast. Hopefully the, the audio and video quality is getting a little bit better. Um, so uh, bear with us. We're still amateurs. 
Um, and uh, of course, if there's anything that you want us to talk about in future episodes uh, or you want to feature as a guest and tell your story uh, on Enjoy the Journey, the podcast, feel free to reach out. And we will catch you next time for episode 13. Don't be shy, guys. Reach out. We want to talk to you guys. If there's any business owners or anyone out there who's listening and think, you know, you want to get on and you want to have a bit of a banter, please reach out to us. We want to banter with you too. We enjoy talking to everyone. Everyone that we've met on this podcast, they're just so interesting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And we want to keep that up. So so reach out. If there's anything you want Jackson and I to talk about, um, let us know because I actually enjoy these chats yeah, with, with you and I sitting here and banter a bit. Um, get in touch. Don't be shy. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you.